Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Uh, we'll just look briefly. Um, again, if you look in a second up at the screens, the structure that we looked at last week will be up there. Um, so we have two main uh, structure, well, two main sections of Ecclesiastes. We kind of start the very beginning with the introduction, which is what we're going to look at today. We already discussed a little bit what Hevel is, is um, and then we're going to look at this poem about the cyclicity of life. And then he, he poses this question at the beginning of Ecclesiastes in verse three of the first chapter, essentially what's the point? What's the profit of human labor, human endeavor. So all these things that humans do, what's the benefit of them? It could be more like a business term, meaning like the profit, or it could also mean like, what, what does it give you an edge? Does it give you an advantage in life under the sun? Uh, and then he's going to go into really spending, it is the whole book, but especially in the first half addressing that question. Uh, and the sectional breaks are broken up by all is hevel and striving after the wind. That's repeated uh, seven times, and uh, then it's never used again throughout the rest of the book. So those are our structural breaks through the first half. And then you can see also that toil is a, is a primary or secondary, I guess, theme in this first half of the book. And then he there's a big break right in the middle, and he asks several more questions particularly about the ability of man uh, to know or to find out what happens next or what happens after them. And he says, no one can find it out. No one knows. And those are kind of the section breaks is listed there. The uh, seven and eight are, are no one can find out. And then nine and 10 are no one can know. That's sort of how it's divisioned up. So um, if you don't have that marked, then maybe, I don't know, take a picture of it or something and you can mark it when you have, when you have a moment. Um, and then he concludes with another poem, this time a poem about growing old and ends with a statement about Hevel and a postscript. So that's kind of how the whole structure is working. So today if we zoom in on that. It's really just one through 11 is what we're going to look at today. Uh, primarily even four, th four through 11, because we already kind of talked about some of the main things in one through three. So uh, bear with me. This is my first time really using or interacting with uh, the using the iPad to do this. So we'll see kind of how it goes. I hope it's helpful. I, I don't know if I'll just kind of at the end to be like, oops, I forgot to mark anything or if I'll mark too much. I don't know. So we'll, I'll just kind of figure that out. It'll be a learning curve for me as well. But uh, the first three verses, um, again, we sort of looked at these things, the words of Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Hevel of Hevels, says Kohelet, Hevel of Hevels, all is Hevel. What does man gain, here's that question, by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? So again, just to point out, we've got the themes. Hevel, of course, is a main one. And then we have prophet, or the Hebrew word is yatron, or gain, or advantage, by all the toil at which he toils, there's another theme, under the sun. So those are kind of all of our, um, the primary themes that are going to be throughout the first half of the book. Um, so just to say this before we jump into the poem, remember the setting too. That the setting, the sphere of this examination is life under the sun. He's examining what it's like to live in a cursed, broken world. So he's not examining ideal. He's not examining eternity. He's not examining even creation, the intent, original intent of creation. He's examining what it's like for you and me right now to live in a broken world. That's the sphere which it happens. Also, remember, oh, and that includes all men. That's not just believers or Christians or people who believe in God. This is what it's like for every human being that lives under the sun. And then also remember, the author, just remember his timeline, that this is Old Testament. This is before Christ. We have a lot of information after Kohelet uh, that can help clarify some of the things he's talking about in, in big ways. But that doesn't mean that what he's saying isn't true. It doesn't mean that what he's saying is misinformed or, or not even informed enough. He, it's, the, it's the word of God given to us, preserved for us. But just remember that we have been blessed with more than Kohelet had when he examined this. 
So I, I'm still a little bit wrestling and battling with how much to bring in uh, sort of New Testament concepts. And I still don't know yet, but we could, because we want to let the weight of what he's saying in his context land. Because if we just so quickly skip to being like, oh, yeah, yeah, Ecclesiastes, but then Jesus came and, and now we have, you know, this purpose and we know that things do last uh, because of eternity, you know, trick shot. It may not last on earth, but it lasts for eternity, so live for eternity. And there's, there's things we should and, and will even talk about, but we want to let the weight of this kind of rest on us. So those are the first three verses, a few things to keep in mind. And now I encourage you to be patient through this book because there's some, I mean, the, the message today from Kohelet, this poem, is not one that you leave like, <laughs> like, this is awesome. I can't wait to go live life today. Um, because he's pointing out some discouraging things about life or some true things that, that can lead to discouragement. Um, so be patient and then just know that this is Kohelet jumping into answering this question, what's the point of all of our efforts under the sun? Okay, so here we go. We're into the text. You didn't believe it would happen after the last two weeks, but we're, we're going to do it. So a generation goes and a generation comes, but, or that is, the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the north and goes around to the south. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has already been, or it has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Let's pray. Our gracious God, as we approach the text this morning, as we look into Ecclesiastes, we do pray for uh, your wisdom. We pray that you would help us to understand some of even just the, the basic foundational building block principles that Kohelet is seeking to instruct us in. As we begin, really, this adventure, this journey of an examination of our lives in a broken world, we do pray that um, you would give us uh, clarity and insight, and we would be careful with your word um, and confident in it. We thank you for it, pray that we would be changed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Kohelet begins to showcase his real-world observations, right? Says the, this is like the results of his experiment or his observations, his, what he's looked at, what, all, all the things that his senses have brought to him. This is the beginning of the conclusion of them. And he says, a generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. To illustrate everything that we're going to say today, just imagine that we are all in a room, which we are, but in a room full of treadmills, okay? And everybody is on their own treadmill. Some of you are like, no, oh, it doesn't sound too bad. Some of you are like, oh, no, I do not want to be on a treadmill. So we're all on a treadmill. We're all just doing this thing. And the trick is that all of these treadmills have a pre-programmed distance that they will go, various ones for each treadmill. And you don't know what that distance is. You're just on the wheel. And when you're distant, when you've completed your distance, a trap door opens underneath you and your treadmill and you drop out and the trap door is replaced and a new treadmill is put in its place with somebody else. And eventually everyone kind of was like, who is that guy that was right next to me? I don't really remember. Who was there two times before him? I don't really remember. And then eventually your own treadmill is going to finish. It's going to ding. Your trap door is going to drop and you're done. That's kind of life. We're all, we're all really busy. 
we're all doing just lots of stuff, right? We're just going, 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 going. And nothing's actually changing in the room. We're not, in one sense, even really accomplishing anything. It's just the cycle, right? You've walked that, that, that tread thousands of times. And then you're done, and somebody else takes your place. That's kind of the picture that he's painting. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't get off. I mean, if you get off, your trap door opens. <laughs> you're done. You can't, you can't get off, and you can't change it. So what are we going to do? Is it, I mean, what are we going to do is really a question for the rest of the book. Today is just establishing, he's basically arguing, no, that is the truth. That's the truth. We're all, we're all in a room full of treadmills. So be encouraged today, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're working, 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 and nothing's going to change. Um, and he begins that by talking about generations. Generations go and generations come. This is his first statement. The, the order of this that goes and comes suggests that he's asserting that human history is just cyclical and monotonous. It's just kind of a wheel, right? Do you remember your great, great, great grandfather's full name? Probably not. I mean, gener they just keep going. They just keep going. And in, you know, four generations, is anyone going to remember your name? Nope. So it's just a continual cycle. Generations come and go. One replaces the other. And so humanity appears to keep undergoing change, right? It's always new. It's always changing, but nothing's changing. Nothing's new. One of man's greatest flaws and desires is to live forever. We don't want to die. We don't like to live. Young people, old people, no, I don't think anybody really likes to live thinking or knowing, remembering, putting before them constantly, they will die. And so even though we can't escape the truth of it, mentally we try to escape it, right? We, we don't think about it. Or people try and do something so great and so amazing. They spend their lives building, trying to change something so that they will be remembered by it and in so doing sort of cheat death or trick death and obtain this, this sort of shadow of immortality, right? Even though I'm not here, my name's going to be there. People are going to remember who I was. And so people, and remember, this is life under the sun. This is not just people who believe in God. This is everybody. This is all, all of humanity just sort of has this objective, this goal to make an impact to be remembered, even if they can't live. And they try and live as long as possible, but eventually the distance programmed on your treadmill runs out. So since, so yeah, we have this, again, flaw, I think, because it's not realistic in, in, in life under the sun, in a broken world, but yet we still have this desire, this drive to accomplish this. So that's sort of the picture of just begin to imagine a cycle, okay? Because that's going to be the theme of the whole morning is, is cycles. And then he says, but, as probably most, if not all of your trans translations say, but the earth remains forever. So we have two options here, and I take the minority position. The majority position is that this phrase, the second phrase, but the earth remains forever, is uh, referring to the permanence of the earth. Okay, so we've just talked about the temporary nature of humans, that they keep coming and going and coming and going. But some would say, in contrast, you look at the earth and it remains forever. So, for example, you look to the east and we have beautiful mountains. And these mountains have stood since long before you. They have seen generations come and generations go. They've seen all of the fashion trends change. They've seen humans look like all sorts of different things, and yet they still stay. Okay, so that's kind of one option. I think if I were to critique that, there's two problems with it. One is that Kohelet's smarter than that, and he's more critical than that. The earth does change. You look at perhaps the great, the mighty oak tree, right? Which has outlasted all of us. And then what happens? A windstorm comes and takes it away. 
that would be Hevel. That would be Kohelet. That would be accurate about life, right? Or perhaps there's this big mountain. It's been standing there forever. And then humans come and stick dynamite under it and blow it up so that we can build a road. That's Hevel. That's more Ecclesiastes, right? So that's kind of, I think the first problem is that the earth actually does change and Kohelet knows better than this. And the second problem is that there's this, there would be an inconsistent interpretation once we get to the end of the poem, because initially he would be pointing out that there's a difference between humans and the earth. One is constantly cyclical changing, one remains forever, but then he goes on to give examples of how in nature, we see cycles just like humanity. He begins to bring uh, things that are similar about the two out. And by the end of it, he's saying, see, human beings, the generations are just like the earth as it constantly is on its treadmill and nothing's changing. So I think a better, and it is the minority, which is why all of our translations would say, but the earth remains forever, right? It's, it's generally the translation. But I think really what he's intending is that the, perm I mean, the permanence of the physical earth really doesn't have anything to do with the individual and how we would live. The point is that people keep coming and going, but nothing changes. And so the earth here, it's, it's like a, the, the word earth is like a synecdoche, which is um, a literary device used to where a part represents the whole, or in this case, um, the container is used to picture the contents. So like we might say the White House. And what we really mean is not actually the building. What we're referring to is all the people that work and operate in the White House. Or perhaps you could say like a keg you're not actually really talking about the keg. You're talking about the contents of it. You're talking about like whatever's in it. Similarly, the earth here is referencing humanity. She was using this literary device to say generations come and generations go, but or and, and humanity somehow remains unchanged. I'm not going to fit there. It's unchanged. So generations come and generations go. It seems like something's happening. There's always something new, apparently, but nothing changes. That's his premise. And that's what he's going to then begin to argue in the following, um, in the following section. So if we read on, the sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, on, and on its circuits the wind returns. And then we have all streams run into the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. So you see three examples from the earth of ways in which cyclicity happens without actually change being accomplished. The sun, the wind and the water. So if we look into each of these three, we have the sun rising and the sun going down. Okay, that's uh, pretty normal. We understand what that's talking about. We're talking literally just about sunrise, sunset. And so the earth, uh, or the, so the sun travels, you know, every day from one side all the way to the other. And it's just working, 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 working. And then as soon as it goes down, what happens? And then it hastens to the place where it rises. And this word, the word hastens here is really um, talking about, the, it's like breathless. It's uh, panting. It's like just more the result of the physical action. So you have the sun just going, 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 going. And then he's like, like run, going back, back, back all the way so that he can come back up the next day, right? East to west, east to west, east to west, every day. And what changes? Absolutely nothing. He's just in this cycle. And ironically, the sun, just to get a little, remember the taste of, taste of Kohelet. Normally, human beings see the sun as just this awesome thing, this uh, majestic thing, this thing that you know, keeps us warm and it's just 
really comforting that every day, you know, the sun's going to come back. And even like uh, if you look at Proverbs 19, uh, the psalmist or Psalms 19, uh, he would say about the sun, the sun is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and he rejoices like a strong man to run its race. It's rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit, same word, to the other end. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Just like this majestic thing. And Koala, it's like, yeah, but <laughs> if you think about it, he's just doing this and nothing's happening. It's repetitive. It's consistent. It's unaffected. It's indifferent. It just keeps going and going. So the sun rises and it works all day, getting from point A to point B, only to retire, pant, breathless, after exerting so much effort to arrive, only to repeat the vigorous cycle. Never ending, exhausting work that seems to not give it any advantage or profit. It's just busy. So, what? profit or edge does the sun gain from all of its toil? Seems like not much. Okay, there's exhibit A. Now we're going to switch directions. And this is pretty cool. Okay, so you have the, you have the English in front of you. So I'm going to, just for the fun of it, we're going to look at this phrase in Hebrew um, for a couple reasons. One, just so that we remember that the Bible wasn't originally written in English, which is kind of cool to put in front of our minds every now and again. Two just to show the, it's just beautiful. It's, uh, it's poetic. I am, wow, very far from a Hebrew scholar, so I'm not, <laughs> not showing off here, trust me. But uh, I just want to show you some of the parallelism, some of the, the beauty of how Kohelet is writing. So we have the going to the south. Okay, going to the south, going to the south. And then turning, we're going to have to make this one bold here, turning to the north. Parallel, right? Going to the south and then turning to the north. So we have one nice, it's a, like a bicolon, it's a set of Hebrew poetry, okay? Then he says, turning and turning. Um, here's wind. Turning and turning. Okay, yes. This is what I want to do. He goes. Who goes? Mr. Wind. So he didn't introduce the character until he was almost done explaining it. So in our English, we get the wind goes to the south and the wind goes to the north. And he says, no, going to the south and, and, and around it's going to the north. And you're like, what's going to the north? And he says, around and around it's going. The wind is going. So he kind of just in a beautiful way, he waits to sort of reveal the character, a little bit of tension, uh, just interesting the way that he does that. And he sets it up. This also is a setup so that he can be parallel again. So you saw that these two words are the same. The going here at the top, and then the going here. We also have the similarity between um, the turning, which I shouldn't have made. We gotta do this. Okay, so we have the turning, 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 round and round and round, cyclicity, cyclicity, cyclicity. And on its circuits, see the same word, savav again. Savav, savav, savav. Turning, turning, turning. And on its turning, Mr. Wind returns. Okay, so you say the, the same ruach there at the end, ruach. So there's three, there's like four things going on. He's Initially, there's a parallel line, which is cool. He doesn't wait to introduce the character till the third line, which he then makes parallel with the following line. And then you just see the theme of this whole poem is... Round and round and round and round. That's beautiful. And it's interesting that it comes, his word, his theme word, comes across more in Hebrew than it is in English. Like we have to put in circuit instead of around because that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the pattern of going around, which is a circuit. So anyways, it's kind of cool. What he's trying to do is he's trying to dizzy you. 
He already dizzied you from east to west with the sun, and now he's dizzying you from north to south with the wind. All directions, just things are going and going and going and going. And what's changing? What is the wind accomplishing? Nothing. Encouraging, right? <clears throat> now we have our third one. Make sure there's nothing else. Lots of flurrying, yes, but no change. Okay, now we have the third one, the streams, or the water. Uh, all streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. So we're going to have two, two sentences here, two ideas here. One is that the streams keep running constantly into the sea, but what doesn't happen? The sea doesn't fill up, which is kind of what you'd expect, right? When you, when you are about to take a bath and you fill up, you know, you turn on the water for the tub and you plug the tub, what happens? Fills up. Natural, normal, right? Why doesn't that happen here? Why isn't anything being accomplished? Why are the streams just constantly running into the sea and it's not filling up? That's not what you would expect. So what's the point of being a stream if you're not doing anything? He's just talking about the repetitive nature. Again, the cycle. Now, it's, uh, it would be nice to imply, and we can just for the fun of it. I don't think that Kohelet was saying this, but you also have here a, a picture of the cycle of water too, right? I mean, he didn't really know about that, so that's probably not exactly what he was talking about. Yeah. Well, he had the Dead Sea. <laughs> is a cycle. So ultimately, then, it's not changing anything. Right. Perhaps. I just think a lot of times people will read this and say, see, evaporation. See, uh, snowfall. See, snow melt. You have this. And I don't know that that perhaps is all that Kohelet was intending. What he's saying is, look, constancy. Look, thousands of cubic pressure behind, behind all of this water, running, 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 running. It's constantly doing this thing. And the sea's not filling up. And then he says to the place, well, this is, yeah, it's, I guess it's the same idea. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. It's just constancy, cyclicity. So those, these are these three examples of how the world, and this is what he's about to do in his argument. He's saying, okay, so this is the way earth is working, right? Constantly doing this. And then in verse eight, he's going to turn his attention to man. Okay, so all things, everything is full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. We do need to clear up one translation thing here and that is that the word for things is the word for words all words are full of weariness it's commonly assumed to mean everything since it comes immediately after four through six uh, but in every instance in Ecclesiastes, the construction always means words, and it never refers to like physical entities. So I don't think he's saying the sun is full of weariness, streams are full of weariness, exactly. He's saying words are full of weariness. He's transitioning to say to, to create another three things. Words are full of weariness, eyes are full of weariness, and ears are full of weariness. Right? You have the, the sun and you have the wind and you have the streams all doing this thing and they're never seem to be changing anything and then you also have words and eyes and ears all these senses all these things that we're bringing in yet are we ever filled up are we ever satisfied and he's saying no it do doesn't seem like even though we've 
we've heard these things that, again, he's about to say there's nothing new. So we're in cycles of, of saying, seeing, and hearing. Humanity is. Generations are. We're just constantly almost saying, seeing, and hearing the same things. Here we go. And we're not filled. The sea's not filled. It's not satisfied. So it's almost up, uh, now he's transitioning to say, so it, yeah, it's his argument pattern. It's his rhetorical strategy is simple and I think effective. He's established his argument using observation, which ironically is seeing, hearing, uh, saying, right? So he's established his observations, which we all agree with. We can all see the cycles of the earth. We can all see what he's saying. And we would say, yeah, we agree. There's no, it's not making progress. It's in a cycle. So then he, once he's gotten you to agree to the preceding facts of life, it now allows him to say, that's what I'm talking about. That's what humanity is like. And so then he makes this perhaps debatable claim that humans never find satisfaction or, or they're not fully filled. That's kind of what, where his big argument's going. Look at the earth. Okay, you agree with that? Now I'm saying that's the same thing with humanity. So humanity kind of mirrors nature. We're busy with words and sights and sounds, but nothing's actually new. It's all cyclical. So there's this, perhaps maybe a suggestion or a possibility would uh, be, he's not saying when he says a man cannot utter it that, that no one's able to speak. That obviously would be untrue. Rather, the point is that no one has anything new to say, anything novel to say, uh, or predict what's going to happen, which he'll argue in the second half of the book. There are words aplenty, there are sights and sounds aplenty, but they're just wearying, they're just repetitive, they've been heard before, they'll be heard again, and you're not saying anything new or enlightening anyone about the future New sayings are kind of hard to come by, right? It seems we just, that's why there are Proverbs because things have been this way for quite some time. So it seems even though people are quick to offer their thoughts as though they're new, it's really not new. One ancient author said, that which has been said is repeated. When what was said is said again, there is no boasting. As for the words of those who were before, indeed, those who come after shall discover them again. Words, sights, sounds. Okay. So what's difficult and frustrating is that you can't break the cycle. You can't, again, get off the treadmill. You've got to stay on it. Or else once you're off, you're done. You can't break the cycle. So then he turns to continue his argument in verse 9. And this is where he really states the punch, which is that there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing new. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Again, cyclicity. Nothing, you can't introduce something new into the cycle because what was is what's going to be. And what, was, what everybody did before is what people are going to do again. So the idea that there's nothing new in life, it's simply the logical conclusion of a cycle, right? If you're saying it's a cycle, you're saying there's nothing new in it. Look, it goes around again and again. If you introduce something new into it, it would be different. It would break the cycle. And we can't do that. So we all participate in routines, and there seems to be no breakthrough despite all of our endeavors. So then he kind of anticipates our interjection, right? He says, I know some of you are going to say, well, look at this. This is new. What about this little baby? This little baby's new. Have you seen this before? And he says, yep, babies have been being born since forever. Or how about this war or the, the, whatever's going on with Iran right now? That's new. Huh? He says, not really. Remember Cain and Abel? It's kind of been happening for a long time. Or maybe you take something like technology, uh, an iPhone. That is, that's new, right? And then you have other philosophers that say, pretty much technology is just an extension of you. 
It's for what? It's for talking, it's for listening, it's for to-dos. And so we've simply created a different way of doing something ancient. We're still talking to each other. We're still making to-do lists. It's nothing new. It's old. People used to do that on you know, rocks or smoke signals or whatever. So it's a different way of doing it, but it's a different way of doing the same cycle. So you didn't introduce something new into the cycle, you just painted it or something. Okay, so he's saying everything that uh, has been already, or, or whatever you may suggest has been already for the ages before us. So then our final verse here, verse 11. There is no remembrance. So this is kind of his second point. There's nothing new, and then there's nothing remembered. And my battery is almost dead. There is nothing remembered of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. So remembering, impacting, making a difference, all the, all the old things are the same things that are coming because what has been done in the past is what will be done in the future. But we have this undeniable propensity to forget the past. So we think it's something new, but it's actually not. So we're just on repeat. But we forget we're on repeat because we forgot the last cycle. So generations come and generations go, and neither past nor future generations will be remembered. And so as generations pass on and new ones come, nothing is changing. Okay, so what do we sort of take out of this? Okay, well, certainly. Yeah, he's, he's, he's trying to prove his point, the hevel of life, the, the um, frustrating, ungraspable sense of life. Yeah, come on. Uh-huh. This is a humbling text. Yep. Yep. Moving forward, new heights, new yeah, change. Yeah, go ahead. Take some stress out of things. <laughs> You're like, yeah, just hop in the dryer and go around and around, you know. <laughs> Here we go. Yep. No. Right, so it's just an honest look. It's an honest look at people who think that we are advancing, 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 advancing. So you're like, actually, we're repeating, 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 even if it looks a little bit different this time around. If you're looking, you'll be like, oh, I've seen this before. <laughs> oh, there that goes again. You know, you're, you're in a cycle. Okay, so there's kind of two things. One, yes, the cyclicity of history, uh, which uh, well, let's bring just a, just a smidge right, of New Testament in here. So which is better? as you're considering, to, to work within the cyclicity of the world, understanding that something, whatever you're chasing, pursuing, will inevitably, inevitably be lost to the cycle and forgotten? Or is it better to live for something that's actually outside the cycle that's going to last forever? No, I'm not supposed to bring in New Testament, but there's a little bit, right? Mac? Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm way over here. And, and to be careful, it's, he hasn't said nothing that you do means anything. He said nothing that you do can break the cycle. Right? To be fair. So we'll just kind of remember that. He's not saying all action is meaningless. Or else why not just toss morality or something like that? Like, well, it doesn't matter. There's a cycle of killing and death. So here we go. 
you know, no, okay. So we want to be, just be careful with that. But yes. Uh, and then the second thing, so the cyclicity of history, which means, again, maybe there's something outside the cycle, which would be good for us to live for. And then two, uh, that people are forgotten. Uh, under the sun, your legacy doesn't live. It can't. And you can't live forever. It doesn't work that way. Um, so where should we locate our identity or our meaning in this life? If you root it in others and their remembrance of you, then you will be severely disappointed. The teacher's kind of undercutting one of humanity's deepest and vainglorious aspirations to secure some permanent place of remembrance in history. A life oriented toward ensuring its legacy for posterity only chases the wind. The future cannot be controlled any more than the past can be fully remembered. So you say, no, 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 no. There's some people in history that we really remember. Well, sort of. I mean, people have had mountains named after them, right? But the following generation can just change the name or, again, destroy the mountain and build a road. Or people have had their names etched into buildings, but... In time, the buildings will be demolished and the names forgotten. Or people have written books and been remembered for a long time, but eventually what happens in scholarship is this. Your name's buried, and people build on what you build, and eventually you're kind of gone. It takes time, enough cycles, and it'll happen. So again, what should we... This teaches us several things not to live for. It teaches us not to live to break the cycle. Not to live to cheat death. Not to live to be remembered. Because all of those things ultimately are just a part of how life under the sun works. So some of the primary things that people, humanity as a whole, are placing all of their efforts toward are empty. That's not everything, but at least these things, which is, remember, this is the beginning of the conversation. This isn't the end of the conversation. We just started. We opened the book and read literally the first 11 verses. So there's a lot more to think about, a lot more to consider, perhaps some more nuance to bring into this, more thoughts that will advance the way that we think about this. But as a starting point, we're in a cycle. You can't break the cycle and you will be forgotten. So don't live for those things. If you do, then you're just kind of a forgotten part of the cycle, which that would be depressing. So life, as much of humanity lives it and pursues it, is thing, is. Let's pray.